Try to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. With your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though... If you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree to sharp and nail it. Confidence of a hero or a fool. I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's so real I to go my life to. That's okay. It means something. It means something. That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed it is. It is a science thing. It is a science place. It is a scientific fact that we are all up in your face. It is time once again for the one, the only, Protonic Reversal. Welcome to it, welcome to it, welcome to it, and additionally, welcome to it. Tonight, tonight's episode, a returning guest, uh, actually one of the most positive feedback guests that I've ever had on this show, believe it or not. Uh, unique performer, vocalist, uh, really just a unique guy, very, very unique thinker. Um, hell of a guy, Shannon Selberg, uh, last appearing on episode 206 of Protonic Reversal. We talked mostly about the cows. We did not talk that much about the heroin sheiks. So we're going to talk about heroin sheiks tonight uh, and... Out of Africa has been reissued by Reptilian Records. So that is a thing that we're going to be doing. And we're going to, I'm sure we'll talk about the cows as well. But if you really want to hear about the cows, episode 206 is like 90% cows. Okay. So uh, real quick, before we get right down to it, boppers, this, of course, is not episode 206. This is episode 269. Nice. And I'm happy to have him back. So, real quick, whether it's first time or a long time, I'm Conan Neutron. I have played in bands and made records for over 21 years. Most notably, I suppose, for Conan Neutron and the Secret Friends. This is Conan Neutron's Protonic Reversal. It's a long-running podcast about music and musicians. This is episode 269. Nice. If this is your first time listening to the show, all the archives are at ProtonicReversal.com and are always free. No ads, no sponsors, no kidding. If you'd like to support the show or get episodes sooner, you can give $1 a month to patreon.com slash Protonic Reversal. If you like the show or even just a single episode, please feel free to share it along, like, subscribe, or post a review. All of that helps people find the show, and it's just a darn nice thing to do. So let's do it. Shannon Selberg. Volume two. Hey, Shannon. Welcome what? back to the show. Oh, hi. Well, <laughs> sorry, my wife, my wife turned off the ringer so I could take a nap today. Ain't that something? Oh, <laughs> fantastic. Well, uh, that's... I'm not holding up the show, am I? Oh, no, no. Not at all. Oh, okay. Not at all. You're, 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 you're <laughs> I doing saw fine. that you had called. I'm like, what the? <laughs> so, uh, welcome back to the show. It's, uh, it's uh, been a while since you were, since you were on it. It's, it's an episode... Uh, two. This is I just said it like literally a second ago. It's episode oh. two sixty nine, right? Yeah, uh, who's counting, right? Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. But who's counting exactly? And then Are it was two on the air right now. You are on the air, Shan Silberg. Welcome. Holy cow! All right, <laughs> on cool. the internet. Because <laughs> uh, yeah, I want to tell the people out there listening. Now I don't know what Conan's been telling you guys, but I actually looked up on the internet what a protonic reversal actually is. <laughs> it, it's it's how you make antimatter. You know yes. what antimatter is, right? Well, oh, first I should, can you swear on this show? Yes, yes, you can. You can. I think you asked okay, that last time, and I always uh, appreciate people asking, even when it's it's uh, you know the answer. Is okay, yes. so if, I, if I'm going to be a dick, I want to be a dick on purpose, right? <laughs> so anyway. But the antimatter, I actually mixed up a small batch, and I got it in the fridge, so I don't accidentally blow up the universe. That's good. 
if I'm going to be a dick, I want to be a dick on purpose. And uh, yeah, that's the end of my monologue. You can go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you don't want to accidentally be a dick, you know, be, be going for, um, you know, the ketchup and then accidentally in the universe or something along those lines. That's uh, that's no bueno. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. A deep thinker. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it occurred to me, and, and not for the first time, uh, but when we spoke last time, which was which was great, we went very in depth mm-hmm. in the cows. We did not go in depth into heroin shakes, and I think that that's mm. that's something that I feel like that band is very underrated, and mm. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, so the end of the cows, ostensibly, uh, Thor decides he's more or less done. Uh, you moved to New York. Yes, I moved to New York, and and we popped out one more album after that, kind of long distance. But Thor, yeah, Thor wasn't in the, getting in little vans and touring anymore. We weren't getting along so great, and uh, you know, we were, we were, uh, in well, we loved each other, but we weren't in love anymore. So, right. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's a long run too. That's a long time for being a band, especially for a band that worked as hard as you did, went to you know put the work in. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. The the cows was just sort of some random people that when we played together, it it formed sort of a chemical reaction, and we just like grabbed on for the ride. <laughs> like, yeah, well, you put me and Thor and Kevin in a room and turn up some amps, and uh, yeah, it, it, so you know. It, Something exploded, and uh, you know, it, I couldn't really recreate that with the heroin shakes. That was it was a different thing. It was uh, more thought out, let's say. Yeah, yeah it, it seemed much more articulated, less you know, chaos theory. Of the band, maybe that uh, <laughs> be the best way to personify that. Yeah, it was, uh, and uh, performance-wise, uh, not only was that chemical reaction occurring live on stage with the cows but uh yeah every single night i tried to do a a different show and uh that gets kind of impossible after a while so you know when you see you know there's a band that you love that's crazy and does crazy shit every time you see them uh after a while some stuff works and some stuff doesn't and you kind of fall into a thing where you, something works you want to do it again and then pretty soon the whole you know a whole set can get that way and uh, if in case anybody's wondering out there why that happens to bands like if you do a move on stage or a little piece of business and it works you, you want to do it again the next night and if it still works and when you add that stuff up, yeah, by the time I was doing the heroin sheiks, uh, I wasn't trying to do the, a different thing every single night. That's all. Yeah, and I think that's interesting because a lot of times people think when they see the, you know, oh, it's a crazy front man, right? Then they, they think like, oh, it's all planned out. It's just, you know, it's an act. It's a you know, the song and dance man, but the song and dance is maybe a little more unorthodox than others. Uh, yeah, it, I don't know about other people, but no, we weren't planning it out. But yeah, it's really nerve wracking to face a crowd in a riot situation and be trying new stuff in real time. And you never know when somebody's going to like punch you in the mouth or maybe you punch somebody in the mouth and like that, you know, that kind of stuff is not sustainable in the long run. <laughs> exactly. And so then it seems like the, with the move to New York, you also had a different a different kind of move for how you wanted to articulate the band. Keeping the intensity, but sort of changing how the compositions came forward. Then, of course, being a different group of people, that also, you know, it's always going to sound different when it's a different group of people. So that initial, initially it was what? You and George, uh, Norm Westberg, and John Fell, I believe, right? Is that, was the yes. first one? Uh, there was a drummer before that, but he didn't actually think he was on the first single, but yeah, he quit the band like the night before we were supposed to go out touring, our first tour. And so I called John Fell on a payphone. I said, hey, John, uh, can you do me a favor? <laughs> You're at all the shows. Do you think you know him well enough to go out on a tour? He said, yeah, when? And I said, tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow night. 
<laughs> How long is the tour? Uh, three weeks, I believe. And uh, he was he was a uh, brave enough and enough of a guy to he stepped right into that breach. Yep. That, that's a that's a brave man, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Now the first, <laughs> some of the first nights were a little rough, and uh, that was our first impression of people. And we had trouble getting those audiences back, to be honest with you. But uh, yeah, I mean, just to try something like that is just unbelievably brave. And he didn't even flinch a bit. Grand record is due. So, yeah, he's a great drummer. Yes, and a great man. As far as I'm concerned. It's kind of it's it's kind of interesting to think about now, just because people look at it in a different way. But the name, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it was sort of a a play on the on the fashion thing, like the, the sort of the model, all the models looking like they were on heroin or whatever, which is a big thing in the like the especially the in the nineties. It seemed like ah yes, the name, the heroin sheiks. Yes, it was uh, probably the biggest obstacle to any success we may have had, <laughs> but. I actually had about 15 names I had come up with, <clears throat> and I put it up to a vote with the band, and that's the one they voted on, much to my chagrin. But uh, that's how we ended up with that name, yes. I had a whole bunch of clever puns and shit like that, but uh, that's the one they wanted, so we went with it. <laughs> well, and it's a play on words, too, because it's heroin like a, her a hero and a heroine. Like it's not like yes. the drug. Well, here's the thing about here's the thing about a band name though. If you have if people ask you what the name of the band is and you have to spell it for them, <laughs> bad idea. Yeah. yeah, not a problem with the cows. The cows is pretty straightforward. No, although I used to make a joke with them. <clears throat> People assume like uh, cows after the animal said, no, actually, uh, it's named after a man named Kaus, who is a Latvian poet. It's a soft S. But, uh, yeah, that went over not so well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did they just kind of blink at you when you said that? Like, what? <laughs> yes. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Who cares? <laughs> what a liar. <laughs> No, not not even with the referencing the band name can it ever be easy, huh? It's just got to uh, hardest hardest route possible. Yes. <laughs> and then there's the vicious controversy about whether it was cows or the cows. Yes, which has never been decided officially, by the way. Did you did you ever land <clears throat> an opinion yourself as to which one it was, or were you ambivalent? Nah, I just decided to spell spell it the cows with a small t, and let's <laughs> keep the controversy going because I don't want to fight about it. Right, right. As long, long as people are talking about it, that's the important thing. Yeah, as long as I don't have to talk about it no more. That's an even more important thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, then uh, you're coming out of you. You did, uh, you know, sorry and pig miner. That was the that that was like what ninety eight or so. So you're you're the the songwriting's a bit more darker. Seems a little more sinister from 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 the outside. Um, and then you put together what is eventually becomes rape on the installment plan. Yes. Uh, well, the thing about that is, is that when we were writing Sari and Pig Minor, we already knew that it was going to be our last album. Right. So, uh, yeah, that chemical reaction, that's, that album was sort of, uh, like the big prehistoric monster sinking into the tar pit. I mean, we knew that <laughs> those were our shrieks of, of anguish and anger about that situation. And uh, But, uh, yeah, that's what Surrey and Pig Minor was. And uh, the heroin sheiks, I just sort of, like, I started writing stuff on the keyboards. And, and if you write songs and you're, you're an exhibitionist, which is kind of important to release in music. If you write a song and you like it, then you want it to be born. So then I had to form a band and, and we had to practice and all that junk. And then we got to play the songs live. So. But I was lucky in that, in that I put out the word on, on the grapevine in, in New York that I was looking for people and really good people started calling me. So, yeah. Worked out. I got just the right people, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, and uh, great talents that are, you know, somewhat different from who you'd played with before, like having different uh, different vibes. Like I was thinking about uh, Norman Westberg, like that guy's got a pretty pretty iconic 
uh, discography himself, right? You know, like you know, so, oh yeah, he's an interesting dude. He's kind of a he's kind of a Vulcan in a way. He's he's very sort of naturally a Zen guy, and uh, and when after a couple of shows, I sort of sent something and I said, "Hey, Norman." why are you even in this band? I don't understand. <laughs> and he looked me right in the eye and he said in his way, well, Shannon, um, it's like this. So far, you keep surprising me. And uh, as long as you keep doing that, I suppose they'll be in the band. And I'll be in the band until I'm not anymore. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, that's hard to <laughs> that's argue with. That's a good with. answer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's very hard to argue with. <laughs> it's like, oh, you put it like that. Yeah, I guess that is right. Uh, yeah. So, so that guy, uh, so, so uh, and, and again, ba- bands I feel like are almost like alchemy, right? Like it's sort of like you get a different metal depending on the different elements and uh, how they're cooked up, so to speak. Yeah, he had a whole different philosophy on guitar playing than, uh, than Thor did. He, he's very uh, tasteful and minimalist. He, he, doesn't play a whole lot of notes, Norman, but he plays the right ones. Yes, right, which which, which is key. And then you had, uh, you know, you, you had Scott on keyboards for that. Yes, one too. another very odd character. He's actually like a really high up executive in the Kelvin Klein company. <laughs> really? Yes. Wow. Yes. His regular real life was that, yeah, he would go into Calvin Klein and he was a really big muckety buck. And he's about the most handsome, mellow, intelligent guy in the world. And, uh, yeah, he was, he walked on water around that place. But at the same time, he had no ego about it. And he made time for the heroin sheiks, took time off of work. And most people didn't even know he was in a crazy punk rock band at all that he worked with. <laughs> and the ones that did just thought that was pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a notable thing. Like, you know, hey, I go skiing on alternate Tuesdays. Oh, okay, cool. You know, great. <laughs> and yeah, he, he he was super nice. And in fact, like a couple of times I was too drunk to go home after practice. And he summoned a limousine to take me home. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Yeah. That service. <laughs> mm-hmm. So then... Uh, and then uh, I think when when John John Phil kind of comes on board, that's when it kind of starts to come together, right? Like he, it's a, he, that seemed like to be a key element. Yes, and then I had to find someone whose job it was to learn my keyboard parts, which that's are uh, a they're extremely unschooled because I don't know any chords, and b. I stupidly severely injured my right arm and hand while I was in the cows. And so my left hand was the one where I could do all the tinkly stuff on the keys. So where I'm going with this is I crossed my hands to write the parts on the keyboards, which makes it very difficult for a regular person to <laughs> sure, yeah, <laughs> to figure them out and, and without even like they wrote the parts. So, yeah. That was a, that was actually always the toughest job to fill. Yeah, well, they're unorthodox, and part of the reasons why because it's it's not traditionally, you're not playing it like a traditional keyboard player at all, too. No, yeah, cross. <laughs> yeah, my hands are always crossed when I play the keyboard, so I'm playing the the rhythm part with my right hand on the left side, and vice versa. And keyboards built so like your thumbs are in a certain place and your fingers are in a certain place that's how they design the keys but uh yeah so it's a little a little bit difficult uh so did you feel that with heroin cheeks the, the original conception of it you were you were writing more more of the songs you're writing more of the music but it still has to be open yeah. to interpretation to become a band uh yeah so yeah they would always start see what i was toward the end of the cows my mom gave me a casio keyboard for christmas mm-hmm and I started writing songs on it, and like th- they show up on like a couple of songs in Sorry and Pig Minor. But once I started up the Heroin Sheiks, that that was the only thing I had to write songs on. So I wrote them all in the keyboard, and uh, I had to come up with enough songs to form a set just to start with. So we had something to rehearse. So it was already that part of it was kind of far along by the time I started getting people together. 
did you it was it a uh, like the, what a, a full range keyboard like the, the all the keys or was it a smaller one no no well it wasn't tiny it was just like two feet wide kind of a hundred a uh, 99 dollar casio right that i wrote on so uh which by the way after a while became a, an issue because the things break easily and they and by the time I started the Hero Sheiks, they didn't make those keyboards anymore. So we, <laughs> we'd have to look in used instrument shops and Craigslist and, and all over the place to try to find the same keyboard, which oh, was man. the only one I could write on. So uh, that's a, that's a bummer. So so it's <laughs> well, we and doubly a bummer that you didn't just have like a relationship with Casio where they get to send you another one, right? Yeah, that would have been that would have been great. <laughs> That would have been brilliant if I was smart enough to think of things like that, but no. But yeah, they're very delicate things, so we would bring a couple of them on tour, and boy, you should have seen the looks on uh, sound men's face when they had to seriously mic a, a, a really cheap <laughs> Casio board to actually play important parts of the song, not right. just to add a little racket here and there. So. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not really implemented as a noise-making device. It's actually a part of the, the melody and the structure of the song. Uh, well, it, yeah, it doubled as a, you know, songs like Jiu-Jitsu, I just pounded on it. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, that was a little tricky, and uh, record producers didn't care for it either. They always complained that it sounded like bubble gum. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I don't think I've ever heard that before, but I, I get it. It's an unorthodox yeah. sound. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, not bubble gum music, literally it's, bubble gum. sounds yeah. like actual bubble gum, right. Yes, I. You really want to play? Do you want me to get you a good keyboard? No, this is the one. Let's just do it. <laughs> that's your thing. That's that's the one that works. Did you have a thought towards not doing Bugle and Heroin Sheiks just because it was kind of associated with the cows? No, I never did. Uh, the thing with yeah, Bugles. You know, I know I learned in, in the cows. I actually gradually learned how to play the damn thing. So. Yeah, I'm not gonna go. Why? Why have one arm tied behind my back? If, if brass fits in, put it in. Sure. Well, and I think that that's something that kind of was was known as like the Shannon Silver thing, right? It's like, oh yeah, even if it's just gonna be like, here's like one like weird bleat as like the punchline to the joke. There's gonna be like you know some bugle that occurs now and again in a band that you would never think would have a bugle in it. Yeah, actually, for a minute, I started thinking that way that. Well, we've got twelve songs here, but none of them have a bugle. I better do a put it. No, nah, I never. I didn't think that way. But after, if you write enough songs, one of them's got to have a bugle in it, just just because you can put it in there. And uh, and the the keyboard doesn't make good horn sounds at all. I tried. <laughs> It does yeah. trombone pretty good, but that's about it. Yeah, horn sounds on the keyboard are generally uh, varying shades of awful, and that's right. That's it's in quotation marks. <laughs> horn. <Yeah. laughs> right, exactly. Right. Uh, the so Ray on the installment plan. Uh, I'm go go and assume that's a, a Celine uh, reference, right? Yeah, when I first, I didn't start, I came to reading literature late because I like to read science. But uh, yeah, so one of the first novels I ever read was Death on the Installment Plan, which was just, uh, his writing style was is very musical and rhythmic. And uh, uh, and he goes off on these, uh, what does he do? He, he kind of hallucinates like out of nowhere and then he goes back to being him and he's a quiet guy and everything just kind of happens to him and uh yeah so yeah i, I kind of bookended the thing with celine references yes yeah yeah of course because yeah, yeah at the end of it you have um you've, you've got another one you've got uh, uh journey to the end of the knife instead of night yeah. Boy, let me tell you, when I was interviewed in France, they were awfully delicate about bringing that up. <laughs> uh, in case you don't know, he, he was out there in radio land or internet land. He was a fascist sympathizer. Yeah. Yes. I'm not fascist at all. I despise fascism, but yeah, I like Celine's writing. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you you sit there and you went, wow, why don't people know more about this excellent writer? And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that it. stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a hard. That's as they say, a harsh toke. 
for sure. Yeah, that would uh, that can hit some people the wrong way. <laughs> Well, and then people make assumptions, right? That you can, I mean, if you're reading something as literature, that you're not, you're not looking at it as like an instruction manual necessarily. And that, and that said, you know, death on the installment plan, journey into the night. These are not like explicitly political screeds. It's like you're sitting around reading Mein Kampf, but you know. no, not at all. Like, no, he hates everybody. Yeah, <laughs> right. Is this a, exactly just <laughs> universal in, in his personal life? By all accounts, he he helped the poor. He was a doctor, and he helped the poor for free. And nobody had any idea that he was had such thoughts until he he started releasing pamphlets, and uh, and then I was off to the races. But uh, yeah, I, I hate fascism, and if you know. Even if I didn't, I mean, the quickest way to get somebody to hate your guts, and rightfully so, is if they think you're a fascist. <laughs> so, yeah. And I'm not. So. Well, so it's, it's, it's good to get, get that out there because I think a lot of times, especially when people are revisiting older stuff, they're looking at the modern context. And uh, yeah. even usage yes. of the word rape could be misconstrued as, you know, just. Yes, and out there in, in the wor- in the music world these days, there's a lot of what in wrestling they call smart marks. People who think they know a lot about uh, why a band does this or that, and they actually don't know anything at all. Which is, uh, yeah, it's just kind of how it is. It's better not to give them ammunition. Yeah, and that's in general, that's probably good. Uh, probably a good ethos. <laughs> yeah. Didn't uh well and, and so I feel like we we've gone through uh, most folks in the lineup. We didn't we didn't talk about George though. He's got an interesting um uh he he's got an interesting sort of uh, motif himself as well. Uh, how did he come into the picture? Well, we were old friends, and once I put the word out that I was looking for people, <clears throat> he was the first guy to respond and he had a practice space and so yeah the heroin chic's jamming actually for a month or two is just me and him in a practice space and yeah he's a good bass player and and we had a good feel for writing music together so uh, yeah that that worked out for a long time and then uh thing about george is and don't get me wrong i love george but he had never really been out in the world touring at all. And uh, he jumped in on the deep end of the pool for sure. And so he made a lot of rookie mistakes on tour, let's call them. And, and uh, I tried to talk to him and he got mad at me. And we eventually sort of fell out that way, mm. which is unfortunate because, yeah, he had an awesome stage present and I'm a very good bass player. And, and, We've been friends for a long time, so. and we were friends afterwards, by the way, too. That's eventually. good. But that, that's hard to but do he's, sometimes. <laughs> he's a Greek person, and uh, he, as he liked to say, we Greek people are very emotional. And, uh, so yeah, we had some hollering matches that that went on for a long time. I mean, like an hour or two at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Did you feel? When writing for this band, did you take a different approach when you were writing the lyrics, or was it kind of about the same, just mining different territory? Uh, no, I kind of write what I write as far as lyrics go and atmosphere of songs and, and like that. So if it's a continuation of the cows to that degree, that's me, and to the degree it's not, that's the new people. Now, I personally... And maybe some people won't like this, but uh, when I want to listen to to music, I, I actually prefer the heroin shakes. Yeah, it sounds better to me. I think it's aged pretty well, whereas the cows, I think, uh, have aged well in a way, but it sounds very much of its time. Like I think heroin shakes don't quite sound quite of its time, uh, if that makes well, sense. Well, actually, yeah, actually, the cows. We thought of ourselves as sort of a, a kind of a blues band. Yeah. And we actually thought we could do that that music like into our sixties. We were gonna like do that the rest of our lives, because to us it was blues. But yeah, um, the cows were much more in the moment, and it was the nineties then. Two thousand was a whole different era, and I was older, and uh, I wasn't writing a an extreme chemical antimatter protonic reversal sort of reaction <laughs> <laughs> in real time 
uh, yeah, because if you think the cows were crazy live, we were actually crazier in practice because we could be. <laughs> right. Once we closed the door to the practice space, we could do whatever the fuck we wanted, and we did. Yes. Well, and you talk, I think, last time about how much that cows practice was you know, just as intense as the shows. Like, it was still war. It's just it was a smaller uh, battlefield. <laughs> to a certain yeah, degree. we weren't making war on people, per se. We were just sort of... Yeah, like I said, when we played together, it was it just exploded. I mean, we barely even we never even talked in practice hardly at all. We would just grind it out for three, four hours, three or four times a week, and because that was our idea of fun. Do you feel like you became a more confident vocalist over the years as you? Oh, as shows? far as being able to, yeah. That was the other thing is the cows were so ungodly loud in practice and on stage. I could never hear myself singing right. and I would put my ear right up to the monitor. So uh, well, if I was falling out of key, I, I had to actually learn which specific vocal cords the right notes were and remember them when I was drunk in order to even get close. Like literal <clears throat> muscle memory. <laughs> but uh yeah and by the way the cows practiced until my throat started bleeding that's when we called it i would spit in my hand every so often and if blood showed up it's like okay two more songs you guys and i gotta go my throat's bleeding again yeah that's, that's... but the hair the hair on sheiks weren't quite as loud but since the cows was the only band i ever knew there was a couple of rules about that I only knew one way to do things, which was, yes, if you're going to be in this band, every practice is like we're playing in front of a thousand people and everything's on the line and it's the last night on earth. And yeah, I'm going to bounce around in here and get fucked up and do whatever I want. And you guys can too. That's rule A. Rule B, I developed a little speech for new people. But uh, yeah, rule B was... <clears throat> Your role is in to playing your instrument isn't that your part is interesting. That's bullshit. Your part has to fit into the music. If you get bored with your part, that's too bad. It's not meant to please you, your individual part. That's not what it's for. This is a band. Third rule. Now, if you're going to join this band, here's the thing. You have to want to be in not the best band on your block, not the best band in this city and not in this state, not even in America. You have to be you have to actively want to be in the best band in the world. If you're not up to that, you're in the wrong band. We might not actually ever fulfill this. Probably not. But anybody worth their salt is like, that's what they're trying to do. Right. And yeah, yeah they had to agree to that stuff. <laughs> Well, and that's daunting, you know, as an elevator yes. pitch, some people are not going to, they're not going to vibe with that, or, or maybe they'll be intimidated by it, or maybe they'll think you're right. crazy. Especially when your only payoff is to tour the country in a little smelly van and half the time play in front of nobody for no money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you might get your ass kicked in the bargain, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah some, exactly. Some audiences take what we do the wrong way. <laughs> Just as a bonus, yeah, exactly. Or maybe that's the right way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did you, did you ever, ever have any reservations about uh, putting F D F uh, on the record, especially to close it out, or did that seem like that was the perfect thing to do? Uh, well, yeah, it seemed like uh, that that was kind of a bummer of, a, of an album. So let's end with the funny one. Right, <laughs> but yeah. leave them laughing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It'll be the hit. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. And, and anytime, you, anytime you put the joke song on, or quote unquote, like the unserious one, like that's the one that always ends up being like the big breakout. <laughs> right, yeah. And I, the cows did that too. We would, you know, we'd write a couple of really deep, dark, serious songs, and then it's like, you know what? I'm tired of that mood. Let's play a funny one, and we'd make up a funny one. Maybe two. And, uh, that's enough funny ones for now. Let's do just a fast one like that. Right. That's Same awesome. thing with the heroin sheets. Yeah. Same sort of deal, even if, uh, even if it uh, comes out differently, right? So. Uh, so. Yeah, it's different people. Sure. Yeah. So Siamese sure. pipe. That's that's the next one. That was. Mm -hmm. um, Which, by the way, 
Reptilian Records is going to be re-releasing in 2022. I just found out yesterday. Do, 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 do. Breaking news, breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> so, very exciting. That, that's awesome stuff. It's so like the cows, and this is probably a bad idea, but the heroin cheeks tried to never stay in a motel. When we were in a town, we like to stay with some of the locals and maybe party a little bit or maybe not, but more get the feel of the town and, and keep the party rolling. And so we, nightly would be treated to the spectacle of the following. Uh, Norman would come out of some room somewhere dressed in only a tiger striped speedo and pimp shoes, open toe <laughs> with no socks. Oh and nothing else. That was it. And him and John would, would light up a cigarello and smoke it together and drink cheap red wine together. That was uh, how they bonded on tour. But, uh, yeah, uh, Norman Westberg is a very eccentric character in, like, the best possible way. Yeah, he was not self-conscious even a little bit about that. <laughs> there could be 50 people at a party, and he would just walk out in that outfit and sit down and nothing was going on. Yep. And on he goes. <laughs> and on he goes. Another interesting story about him is several years into the band on tour, we were playing Kalamazoo, Michigan. And the crowd decided that they didn't like us before we even started playing because of someone very sweetly wrote in the urinal, these heroin sheiks are old. So anyway, we start playing and we're getting a little bit heckled by the audience. So I said, uh, hey, Norman, that guy jumps on stage one more time. I want you to kick him. And he looked a little bit sheepish and he said, um, but Shannon, um, this is live during a show, by the way, <laughs> in between songs. <laughs> and he said, but Shannon, um, you might I was in the swans, and you'll find this hard to believe, but I have never struck another human being in anger. Like, all right, well, this guy needs to be kicked, Norman, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to drag him on stage and bend him over, and you kick him in the ass. <laughs> so, all right, Shannon, I think I can do that. And yeah, halfway through the next song, uh, some guy's playing around on stage. I dragged him up, bent him over, and... Norman kicked him, and he, he he looked like a little kid that just got handed a popsicle or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so did did you feel like – so that's a good question. Was what, Do you think there was expectations of antics just because of the kind of show that you put on, the kind of show that the people kind of knew the cows from? Did you feel Oh, like... I suppose so, yeah. I mean, antics are fun. <laughs> that's the way I do them. Well, actually – I told you last interview, but the real reason for all the antics was to keep, see, there's a trouble which increased through time of having it to really listen to music. You got to be in that exact moment. You can't be thinking about five seconds ago and you can't be thinking about five seconds from now. You got to be exactly in the moment. So the nature of the antics was to send conflicting signifiers it's called and thus to keep the audience in a perpetual state of unbalance and surprise so that they're in the moment so yes antics were expected but after a while after noise rock <clears throat> sort of passed by and every weird thing was tried uh, after about 10 seconds people would say ah, i know what these guys are they're a crazy singer band ah i, nah, I don't want it like that so, yeah, that was a little, but I didn't know what else to do on stage, so I kept trying to do that. But, yeah, more and more as time went by, it didn't work anymore. That's part of why I stopped doing music, and you know, that's why I stopped. It wasn't working anymore. What the heroin sheiks and the cows are specifically designed to do is to create a certain experience. After a while, people didn't want to have that experience anymore. and You can't force them to. But if they don't even want that, then, uh, yeah, you, you, you just – it becomes an act of futility. Yeah. Well, certainly. And then – so then that takes us back to where you're at, you know, post-Siamese Pipe. You've, I think this is this is about when you've got that tour coming up with um, Gibby – was it Gibby and his and – his, 
I forget. Oh, the, the Gibby name. Haynes experience. Gibby Haynes yes. experience. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you, you're sitting there as basically. Are you like? Are you thinking? Oh, I need to get some of those one man band like symbols that I can slap to my leg. Like, you're the oh, only no, one left, I didn't right? what we did at all. In fact, <laughs> quite the opposite. <clears throat> See, the story about the that tour we did with them was is that they were already well into the tour, and they weren't getting along anymore to such an extent that the opening band wanted to quit. And even that band was only hanging together by a thread. Now, I kind of knew Gibby from around New York. I had seen him. And in fact, I witnessed a few times the sad spectacle of Gibby Haynes trying to get into a club for free. I mean, why shouldn't he? He's Gibby Haynes. And the doorman's like, Gibby Haynes, never heard of you. And like, with Gibby standing right there, I went off on the kid. And I'm like, "You you don't know who this is? Dude, this is Gibby fucking Haynes, I mean, yeah. pull your head out of your ass and let the guy in. What the fuck's the matter with you? And, and like that, and they, they let him in. So uh, I already knew Gibby that way. And, you know, I suppose he was somewhat aware of the music I was doing. But anyway, we uh, on short, kind of short notice, we ended up hooking up with that band. Now, the attendance to the individual shows was actually pretty sparse, which is probably why they were all fighting besides Gibby being a very eccentric person. And, uh, yeah, one day early in the tour, we we had our merch tape set up, and he walks up, looks at the, all of our CDs, and, which one's the good one? Like that. <laughs> yeah, okay, I know this is. But anyway, we would play as the openers. We even had a sparser crowd. and, and But every night, his band would come out and watch us. And, yeah, we always played like it was the last day on earth. We didn't care if anybody was there, if they like it or they don't like it. We do our show. And, uh, yeah, we'd leave the stage, and they would get up and do their thing, and that would be the night. Now, about halfway through the tour, I was waiting to play and i was outside the club and it was pitch black and i saw a figure in the darkness and it was gibby haynes and he was kind of feeling in the dumps we hadn't talked a whole lot because i was doing a whole bunch of weird shit because <laughs> uh i'll get back to where this part of the story but yeah the whole tour since there didn't seem to be any dressing rooms anywhere and I don't like people looking at me and getting an idea of what I'm going to do. So I started doing this act like I had really bad ADD. I would walk all over the club since I had nowhere to hide. And I would keep touching the same spot over and over again without, you know, like I was something wrong with me. And not only that, since at that stage I was getting pretty old to be going on at midnight, I would take instant coffee uh, Everybody, every place gives you free water, so I would dump a bunch of that coffee in there and shake it up <laughs> and drink it right before it went on, which Gibby observes. So, yeah, he thought I was a pretty weird guy. <laughs> and uh, so I saw him out, <clears throat> back to where we were. I saw him outside, and I said, Gibby, why so down? He's like, uh, this is just terrible. It sucks. I said, well, Gibby, you know, it's not my place to say it, but, like, you're the man. I mean, you give me fucking hands. People want you to stop looking at that little board of yours, look at them in the eye, and just fucking be Gibby Haynes. I mean, if if you just did a, a little two-step for two seconds, the audience would fall down and, and, and they go nuts. This is a long pause. Really? <laughs> Yes, they're paying to see Gibby Haynes, and, and you're all locked into your little soundboard, and and yeah, just engage with them just a little, not a lot, just a little bit, and uh, you'll be fine. You'll see. And that night, he actually did that, and the crowd went nuts, and and he dug that for a little while, but by the end of the tour, he, uh, I guess he must have decided that that was selling out, or or. You know, I, I'm not going to get up there and wiggle my ass and all that kind of stuff. So he went back to to looking at his board again. But, yeah, it was it was kind of an odd experience because, yeah, the butt old surfers, were, after seeing them and him and his clothes pins and his dick tucked between his legs and all that shit, like, holy fuck, music can beat us? Yeah, maybe someday I'll do this. But, uh, yeah. 
So it was weird talking to him that way. Yeah. But after the tour, it ended in Texas, Houston. And it was an okay crowd, but not great. And But they still had two days left of the tour. And we already started the drive home, and we got a call from them. And they really wanted us to come and play the last two shows. And uh, they would double our money. And, and we probably would have did it, but we were already in, like, you know, Georgia or something. So, But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how that went for them, but, yeah, I would have did it. But, yeah, that was a, that was a really weird experience. I would imagine so, yeah. <laughs> did you find that – well, and, and also let's – you know, let's set the stage, right? That like this, this is this is post butthole surfers having what might seem unorthodox to people that were from there, there were for them at the beginning, a hit. You know, a, a uh, yeah, hit, I don't know right? if Gibby Haynes' experience was doing well and that well. I just like tour with Gibby Haynes. Yeah, of course yeah. I want to do that. It's interesting. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't really care about the rest of it, but. Like I said, we always played every night, like our backs were against the wall. And uh, yeah, after I, I think that kind of rejuvenated, you know, the musicians that were playing with them were kind of struggling with that kind of thing. And uh, I, I think we might have helped them out a little bit, morale wise. Yeah. Because nobody liked us. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we did it anyway. Who cares? <laughs> You care if they like us or not. What's that have to do with me? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, then after that, so did, did you find that to be a learning experience then? As, as far as you know, why, why you're you know why you're doing it, why you're continuing to do it, what you were hoping to accomplish, or did you kind of feel like you already knew? All no, that I just no. Uh, the beginning and end of it was like I I had to give Gibby hands. The man, I had to give him a pep talk? Wow, that's heavy. Because <laughs> I myself was struggling, you know. It's right. hard to do that every night. And I was outside with my, I always play a couple songs before we hit the stage just to inspire me. I think at that point I was playing uh, Blue Flowers and I'm Destructive by Dr. Octodon. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's wow. what I hit the stage after. And uh, I had just finished listening to that when, uh, right before I I ran into Gibby, but yeah, it was like, uh, I got to go in and entertain these folks and do a number for them. That's kind of as a drag, but yeah, well, you signed, you signed up for it. You got to do it. People are paying to see this shit. And yeah, do I, and furthermore, I mean, do I look like a guy who gives a fuck what people think? No, I hope <laughs> not. Because <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> so then begets the recently reissued uh, to a, to a, this people that maybe missed it the first time or weren't around for the first time uh, the out of Africa right out that's Africa a- it's a combination of Africa and America and the out of Africa theory and how American pop culture was sort of like uh, migrated out of America and took over the whole world. It's it's a very scientific joke, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's also very difficult to say, and I had never heard it uh, spoken aloud uh, before the show. Yeah, nothing mixes <laughs> quite like noise rock and anthropology, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so very briefly, can you give me, I mean, it's, it's obviously it's an anthropological thing, but the whole out of Africa yeah, concept. Can you get, give the listeners? Not me, I know, of course, but like for the yes. listeners, I named one of the continents Cock Asia for Caucasia, obviously, and, and and like that. Yes, very scientific, <laughs> <laughs> and yet satirical. There's South Caucasia too, you know, East Caucasia, South Caucasia. Yeah, I ran out of I ran out of puns, so yeah, I repeated myself. <laughs> Besides, Australia's kind of officially a white country now so yeah it's out of africa sure <laughs> they like rock and roll and all that shit so ultimately the the, the heroin cheeks as the band is beside yourself 100 percent turnover at this point like it's all all folks that weren't around at the beginning but 
I mean, the record sounds yes. very vital. Like, it's got a... And once again, I put the word out, and once again, I lucked out and got some really good people. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, Martin Ross is the first guy I talked to. And he's a tough guy, see? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he uh, he had a very serious sit-down with me in a bar for, like, a couple of hours, feeling me out. And, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a big, mean-looking uh, intense guy. So, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess I passed muster. He agreed to do it, but, uh, yeah, he, he's really good. Yes. <laughs> well, and it it doesn't sound like in any way, shape or form, like a band in trouble or on the ropes or anything along those lines. It's, it's, I mean, I, I, I think I should it, hope not. It, it almost, know, I, I give tough auditions. Yeah. I was going to say, like, it seems like you found the people that you gave your very challenging, uh, you know, entrance interview i guess you would call it <laughs> when you were talking yeah. to people with a band you found the right yeah. folks right in fact yeah to get a guitar player i would put them through the following test there's a song called brooklyn town romeo which is a really kind of weird complicated riff <laughs> guitar riff right and a lot of guys uh, i would play it for them and they would just look at me like are you serious are you serious? Do you want me to play that? And I, Damn right I do. You better give. It, you better do it well, because yeah, this is your test, dude. <laughs> right. Like, like if you if you if you can get through those and get through to the things that maybe you'll find more in your wheelhouse or whatever. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Oh uh, yeah, if they, yeah, if they could play that song, yeah, they can play anything. So yeah. <laughs> and I think I did that with bass players too. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, so let's do. Uh, so, since this is the one that, uh, and of course, uh, it, it's available Reptilian Records, Reptilian Records at yes. Um Chris X, yes. Chris X has re released this excellent record. Uh, and he did the first one too. So, everything goes in a circle. So, let's just do, let's do this thing that I do sometimes in the show where we just kind of go through each of the songs and you can kind of tell me a little bit about each one, you know, whether okay. it's uh, lyrically, you know, conceptually, if there's some right. memories, some along those lines. So first one is uh, Stabbed by an Angel. Yes. So that conceptually was, is on the keyboard setting for trombone. <laughs> I, I wrote the, you know, the basic trombone riff that floats through it. And then after that, uh, one day we were waiting for Soundcheck to play a show in Brooklyn, and the line came to me uh, about, uh, oh, is that I, I am, I am the Eggman or whatever that whole thing. Yeah, that, it's like okay, I'm saving that for a song. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, the the song is sort of conception of it is is what what if when Jesus was wait you know about to be born what if the guy renting out the manger to him was actually the devil (laughs) yes so yeah that's what the lyrics are sort of about i I jammed that theme in there yeah that's one way to take it did you have uh, an idea that that was going to be the first song of the record uh yeah well uh, I waited. I always wait till we're done recording, and then sort of write it like uh, a continuous set list. With uh, you know, you start out with the bang, and then you build it this way, and then you change tempo a little bit, and come back hard, and and like that. So uh, yeah, I am. Uh, wait, I am Yahweh's leg man. I am. Wait, uh, no, I am Satan's leg man. I am Yahweh's dealer. Yeah, that was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so of course, after that, we have uh, Cock Asia. Oh uh, yes, that was uh, just sort of a commentary and the the brutalness of an immigrant moving to America. Yes, and then at the end, sort of a a punch at the at the boomer generation. You guzzled the freedom, but now you want your kids to sip. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's kind of a serious one. But, yeah, it begins the uh, immigrant works here, and they put you to work and menial labor, and then you have to take a bunch of abuse for a generation or two before you're an American. And, and yeah, that's what that song's about. 
did you ever feel like like did you did you did you feel like that was a natural thing to write about or did you have an explicit kind of like hey this is uh kind of just fit the song yeah i don't know yeah it, it, it seemed like yeah i just do that whatever the song sounds like whatever vibe that gives off that's kind of the direction i try to go off or it's opposite just to kind of throw people off and keep them in the moment sure. something sounds funny with this you know, like open you up. That sounds like a little poppy song, but it's kind of not. Yeah, right. Until you tell you listen closely to what's being, what's being said. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, how about you to which is <clears throat> play on coup d'état? I would assume, right? Oh uh, uh, yeah, you is just uh, sort of like breaking up with someone as overthrowing the government. I guess you could say. It's a you data. I know whose ring you've been kissing, and it's more than your land that I'll be taking, and stuff like that. <laughs> that's what that song is. That's a catchy one too. That's a, that's that's a. I think that that seems to be like a, a favorite of a lot of folks on that record. Uh yeah, yeah. Break up. I did. Is next. Oh, break up was just. I don't know. So many people that I knew just. You know, I don't mind hearing about somebody else's like fights and and, and all that, but like about the hundredth time, it's like just fucking break up already. <laughs> <laughs> just fucking break up. So yeah, I take all the characters. I take his side and her side and my side. Yeah, it is a Three thing. Characters, yeah. That that is absolutely a thing too. Like people like you know choosing sides and yeah, you, know, you get this friend. Yeah. It's like you divvy up the books, you divvy up the records, you divvy up the friends. Right, fighting like two dinosaurs rolling down a hill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After that, we have the aforementioned Brooklyn Town Rodeo. Yeah, every once in a while, every so often, I just like to write a song like the old blues guys you know like the cows that song one of them was mine where i own the entire world and yeah brooklyn town romeo was actually uh there's a germ song i forget which one it sounds like he's saying the term brooklyn town romeo i am better like that so i thought that would be a good song title seeing as i lived in brooklyn and then the rest of it i'm just bragging about what a, a big stud lover man i am because that's what breaking songs do yeah <laughs> of course yeah naturally <laughs> uh next, What's next next up is pillow talk which features some some guest appearances by some very famous actors oh yeah pillow talk see uh there was a song on the first album i forget which one but uh, uh since new york has a lot of dance clubs in it the conception of that song was that I thought that it, if I could get that to a DJ, that could become a big dance hit. Kind of, it's got that really got thick bass line yeah. and, and some samples of uh, Dennis Hopper, talk, you know, from Blue Velvet, talked about, I'll fuck anything that moves. And that uh, Bruce and Campbell the, and the guy says, Ruby. That's just pillow talk, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's. <laughs> I think in an alternate universe that could have been a dance hit, you know? Why not? Why could Yes. Uh, did you... Maybe even in this one. Uh, I couldn't you... find a DJ. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know who you, you find these days, but yeah. It is first time on vinyl, right? Uh, Reptilianrecords.com. I, I, this was nah, never... Actually, I did find a DJ that worked in a big club that was actually going to play it, and then uh, somebody in New York kind of backstabbed me. Hey. They ended up not playing it. That's a bummer. I won't get into that whole story because it would involve busting people. Who, some of the listeners might think highly of. Gotcha. <laughs> and there's no point in that. The names will be changed to protect the innocent and the guilty. Sure. <laughs> uh, Jaws of Life. Oh, yeah. I've sort of. That's just kind of part of my existence because, uh, well, in my youth, I was a nature survivalist who would go out into the wilderness with a knife and a blanket and a piece of flint and kind of live off the land. And that's a it's a very grim existence, but like you got to be in the moment all the time. And 
you can't let things get you down. You got to keep searching for food and you got to chop firewood and you got, you got to do all that stuff. So along those lines, that grim level of existence, when I moved to New York, I was really worried that uh, I would get swallowed up and destroyed because New York is a big uncaring city. And the way I thought of it was, it's like when you watch a nature documentary and there's some 20 foot long fish and maybe a littler fish swims too close and it just very absentmindedly just, just eats it. Nobody cares. <laughs> Even the guy, even the fish doing the eating doesn't give it a second thought. And that's kind of how I, I thought about New York in a way. And yeah, so I wrote a song about that phenomenon, the jaws of life. They're always swimming out there. You don't want to let them get close enough to snap you up. Right. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Mr. Innocence after that. Uh, Mr. Innocent. Well, it's kind of a it's kind of a political phenomenon in America. <clears throat> Something that Americans seem to be attached to is the concept of innocence, as in why I didn't know the black neighborhood was so vicious, and I didn't know this other thing was going on, and I didn't know this other thing was going on. Why I'm innocent, and when a child's growing up. The parents work very hard to protect what? The child's innocence. Well, in a Jaws of Life world, you don't have a right to your innocence. That's uh, that's just right. another word for ignorance in my book. So uh, 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 that's what I wrote that song about, Mr. Innocent. I'm tired of hearing your bullshit about how innocent you are. Cause you're not. <laughs> did, did you... Uh... Did you feel the time? How'd you feel at the time for your own sort of innocence and <laughs> being in this sort of uh, who you know world where you're trying to do your best and you're putting out your best work and it almost just doesn't matter at all to a lot of these folks? Oh, no, I wasn't thinking that. That phenomenon is more like the jaws of life, you know, swallow or be swallowed. No, Mr. Innocent was more like nationally it's an american thing to america thinks it's innocent i mean the cia is out there murdering people and overthrowing <laughs> governments and all this shit and you tell a regular american about that and wow i didn't know we, i had we, no idea i'm innocent we were yeah. bringing them freedom shannon hadn't you heard i did hear that yes <laughs> <clears throat> the reviews were terrible yeah, we, we brought you <laughs> freedom so free. you burned our village down yeah but you're free now so it's, it's, it's yes, better. it's just collateral damage. <laughs> exactly. yes. uh, through is after that. Ah, oh, yes. So, yes, uh, that is a song about people that you're vaguely aware of. Maybe a glimpse through a window, you see a little girl. Or maybe some other time you see a mean man in there. But what it's about is... A man who has a daughter, and when she's very little girl, he sells her into prostitution. And, uh, yeah, I believe he, I say that he has the morals of a greasy sack or something like that. But, uh, yeah, and then uh, so he destroys her life. And then at the end, the, the punchline is, yeah, his his first she was his second daughter. I say that through the song. His first daughter had it even worse. She was the center of his whole universe. And then after that, there's a long instrumental part where Martin Ross plays what I think is one of the most beautiful guitar parts ever written by anyone. It's so, a very cool part, yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that's what that song is about. And I think uh, that solo totally captures it. Are you a big fan? But, of like I said, part of this thing is uh, with music, you try to give people an experience. And uh, yeah, I don't know how many people want the experience of listening about that little girl, but yeah, there it is. <laughs> yes. Sometimes people Sorry. don't want to think about, they, they, they say they want to think about it, but they don't want to think about certain things when it's yes, too dark. protecting their innocence, yes. Yeah. Ah, yes, very good. <laughs> very good. <laughs> uh, so after that, we have... 
The Obscenery, which features a pretty excellent vocal performance. Uh, yeah, well... Kind of Lou <clears throat> Reed, almost. What's that? Almost kind of Lou Reed-ish at his best. Yeah, yeah Lou Reed-ish or Iggy-ish or something. I'll cop to that. But, uh, yeah, that song was... You know, I had the riff sitting around for a long time on the piano. But I was in a relationship, and one day my girlfriend asked me, like, how come you've never written a song about me? I said, have you listened to any of my albums? <laughs> you don't want that. But so I just, I, I decided to write one kind of pretty about us going, holding hands. And it's uncharacteristic, but yeah, it's something different. I like it. Yeah. And it's, I think it could have been on the radio. I don't think I swear or anything. I, I was going to say it, it, it could have had a larger, a larger impact maybe in a, in a different time, a little earlier, a little late maybe uh, yeah, for that. But Yeah, sure. So maybe some kid will pick it up in 10 years and will take off. But you never know. You never know. <laughs> so then that brings us to, I would say, one of the best use of uh, the Manamana songs in uh, any <laughs> recording <laughs> one of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a small club as it turns out uh, which is a harmonic fix right so yeah there's a keyboard sound in there that i've been monkeying around with for a few years and we needed to fill a couple more minutes on the album and and uh, me and the producer were monkeying around in the studio early with nobody there and i said uh, yeah check this sound out Wow. And then he said, uh, what are you going to do with it? And so the Howard Stern show used to have a regular caller who was insane. He would get on the show and he would just, the only thing he ever did in a very mellow FM voice was say, I am Dr. Remulek. I am Dr. Remulek. I am Dr. Remulek. I am Dr. Remulek. And Howard Stern would like talk over the top of him. And the guy would never stop until Howard Stern hung up on him. So that's the first part of the song, Dr. Right. Remulak. And then uh, I turned it into, yeah, the Manamana song. And, and uh, I had a friend of mine come in and, and do the female voices. And, uh, yeah, I, I think it's pretty. It's a good one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so that, that ends the record proper. But you do have a, a title track, but it's like a hidden track. Yeah. That was a song that I also had written a long time ago, and uh, it's really different from anything I'd done before, and I still wasn't feeling super comfortable with it. So I put it on as a bonus track, which I regret now very much, but uh, yeah. And not only that, I, I got into a fight with Martin Ross about Marty. I, I, I didn't like the guitar part he did. And I regret that too, because now I, uh, he was right. I really like it a lot now, and can't even imagine a different. You, but that's uh, a really good song. I wish I would have put it in the band album a lot. Yeah. Do you feel like that's something that happens a lot with you that you look back on things and just as a different person later on you view it? No, nah, not a lot, but once in a while, yeah, that's one of them. <laughs> yes. I, uh, yeah, I don't. Since I always try to do my best, whatever I'm doing, I, I, and, uh, yeah, I don't have a lot of regrets. Not to say I didn't hurt some people because I didn't know better, but yeah, I know better now. Question from the chat box Were you in New York City during 9 11? I sure was. Yes, it was. It was crazy. I was, I was laying in bed one morning and sleeping late, as musicians do. And there was a hard knock on my door. I said, what do you want? And I said, your girlfriend's on the phone. Tell her to call me back later. About 30 seconds after that, yeah, there was another pound. And uh, he said, it's World War Three. Get the fuck out of bed. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. And so I got out. And I, the, the, the street I happened to live on in Long Island City at that time had a diagonal street. So all I had to do was walk out into the middle of the a street and I could see that yes the buildings were on fire and uh, that was very alarming so my idea was is to go straight to her house which is like right straight across the river from the Twin Towers and uh, 
So I, I started running and I want to catch a cab. I thought this is like a two mile run. <laughs> it's pretty far. But there wasn't a cab to be seen. I'm like, that's weird. Well, here's a cab company right here. And I actually went inside of a big building where a lot of cab drivers were sitting at a table. And they happened to be Muslim. And I said, can I get a cab? And they looked at me like I was insane. And I don't blame them. They said, oh, no, we, uh, we're not driving today. And I said, uh, yeah, I, uh, okay, I get that. So I ran the rest <laughs> right. of the way through the house. And, uh Oddly enough, even though the buildings were burning right in front of them, everybody was about six people were gathered around the TV set watching them burn. <laughs> they were like right across the river burning, which is an odd phenomenon. And then it. after that, she told me that she found out because her upstairs neighbors had spent the night on the roof smoking really strong weed. And the sun came up and they were still laying around on lawn chairs, smoking weed, and, and yeah, they saw the, f the first plane <laughs> oh fly into the building. <laughs> wow. And they looked at each other, and long pause, like, uh, did you see a jet fly into the Twin Towers? <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. Did you? And like, yeah, like that. <laughs> wow. And then the second one hit, and they knew it was real. But, yeah, wow. Talk about being paranoid when you're smoking weed. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's like the worst being high story ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's that's harsh. Yeah, hor obviously a horrible day. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was crazy. And, yeah, we were close enough where papers from the buildings were floating in. And nobody knew what the fuck was going on. Bush had his thumb in his ass, and then he's like disappears into the sky somewhere. Like, yeah. what the fuck's going on? Is it World War Three or not? <laughs> Just I want answers, damn it. Because <laughs> <laughs> this this is a pretty thick brick building, but I want to be somewhere better than this and further away. Yes. See, I'm so paranoid about the jaws of life. I always worried that if some kind of shit went down, I'd be stuck on a fucking island. <laughs> that's true though yeah, yeah you that's be. not a good place to be when all the shit like you know society's falling apart and all that shit you don't want to be stuck on an island be able to run to where it's safe countryside somewhere exactly <laughs> which is not not new york <laughs> no not new york way. no um so that that actually bookends well with sort of the end of the new york chapter of the heroin chic's you know, about 2006, uh, you yeah, back, right? right? The heroin cheeks, New York, eventually even fell apart. And then I'm like, well, I've given it to go college try and beat my head up against the wall for six years. This isn't working. <laughs> so in New York, there's a thing where, you know, it's, it, it's really expensive. I call it the dream tax because everybody there has a dream that they're trying to do and they're willing to pay big rent on it. And uh, I was like, well, and plus, you know, anybody in New York, if you don't have three big projects going on at once, they think you're a fucking asshole. So uh, <laughs> that was my big project at the time. And like, well, what the fuck am I staying here for? I might as well go back to Minneapolis because that's where my parents live. And I don't want to be stuck on an island if one of them dies and I'm too much of a, a, a dumbass and, and too poor to fly back in. Uh, yeah, I'll just go back to Minneapolis. That's why I went back. And so you end up keeping the uh, heroin cheese going. You have uh, the guy from Stunning, uh, Jesse on bass, and um, Paul from Hammerhead, right? Once and again, yes, I put the word out, and I lucked out that just all the best players were wanting to do it. And again, I put the name up for a vote. This is a different band from top to bottom. How about we change the name? <laughs> and I got voted down again. So. <laughs> they were looking for it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, they hadn't actually lived the experience of being in a band called that. And, and you know, people don't, a lot of people won't even talk about it or review it because it has that bad word in it. So. But you think heroin's funny? That's, that's just, 
terrible. <laughs> what are you, a fascist or something? <laughs> but, but but yeah, but then go back to the like you got to spell it out. No, it's H E R O I N. Hello, hello. Uh, hello. Then, yeah, yeah. If I got to spell it, it yeah, I've already lost. Kids, take note. <laughs> Make sure you don't have to spell your band name. <laughs> or I tried even pronouncing it different for a while. I didn't know. What's the name of your band? The Heroin Sheiks. Like, what the fuck is heroin? I never heard it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's. Oh, heroin. That's a terrible Oh, word. okay. No, heroin. It's up with women and shit. <laughs> oh, all right. Fuck. I give up. <laughs> but yeah, we gave it again. I, I didn't know that we would end up kind of not working out as quickly as we did and uh so i decided to put out an album that was kind of more just straight rock and roll kind of the cleanse of the palate for yeah. the next one that was going to be more fucked up but never got a shot at that one because uh yeah one day we played a show and it was okay attended but it was a small place and after the show paul sanders Walk, you know, he walks up to me and he looks me in the eye, serious as God. He says, uh, Shannon, answer me one question. Yeah, Paul. He said, who do you think your audience is supposed to be? Who's your audience? Hmm. You know what, Paul? I never thought of that. I don't know. <laughs> like, exactly. He said, yes. I said, and, uh, yeah, we didn't last more than a couple weeks after that. Yeah. Yep. I didn't, yeah, uh, people started falling off and uh, I didn't fight it. And, and putting together bands that stay together is obviously not more my forte. So I'm really hard to work with them. I mean, really, I have to practice like it's the end of the fucking world with you bouncing around like an idiot and all that. Like, yeah, nah, that's just too much. <laughs> and plus, yeah, you know, Music is a community now, and everybody's in a couple of bands. I'm like, what? You have material you can't use here? Who says so? Use it. What are you in another band for? <laughs> I'm old school that way. Yeah, so, I mean, th th there's certainly interest in, you know, some folks in the chat box were asking if you were, um, you know, had any music you are doing now, if you had any current projects or anything on the agenda. <laughs> Oh no, I am. I, I am. I'm. I won't even. I don't even play on the keyboards or the horns or anything anymore, because if I write a great song on the keyboards, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to want that song to be born, and to do that, I need a band because I don't know anything about the studio and I don't care because I just like playing live. See, so it's like uh, the whole idea of putting another band together and kicking out another album at my age and putting all that i can but yeah I'm, I'm, i can still do it if i want but why would i want to uh, I, i'm not interested in being a nostalgia act whatsoever uh and nostalgia is not my thing that's why uh, getting the cows back together was so hard when we did it because none of us is in the nostalgia uh, i don't like that emotion it makes me uncomfortable so uh there's not really any reason to do it. I mean, I, I had more fun than God. It should have been illegal, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, nobody wants to have that experience anymore, except maybe nostalgia, which, you know, I went to a show that was just the craziest fucking show, and there was people out there, like, on their cell phone. <laughs> and people pointing their cell phone like the Twin Towers, like the Twin Towers are right in front of you, dude. Look at it. <laughs> Don't hold up your phone to it. You're not in the moment. And if I was, if I had been on stage when that happened, I would have taken that cell phone and stepped on it without even thinking about it. And that would have been a thing. And what I do on stage now is probably considered illegal and, and against the rules. And that would get in big trouble. And yeah. I can't if I can't do exactly what I want to do on stage. I don't want to do anything at all up there. That's all. So, yeah, there's no reason to do that. And yeah, the rest. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's why I don't do music. Because if I write a song, it has to be born, and then I'm back in that whole train again. And I'm too old to tour in little vans because it's uh, pretty hard living. Because 
yeah, I drink a lot on the road and smoke and all that shit, like way too much. So again, if it's not going to do anything, well, like why should I do it? Is yeah, that a good it's, answer? It's, it's hard to kind of muster up the enthusiasm on something if you're not going to be able to do it the way you want to do it, too. I mean, uh, yeah, because if I, yeah, you know, to me, I'm a real simple guy, and yeah, being live on stage should be getting. It should be like getting buck wild when you're having sex. You don't want to think about nothing. You just fucking do your best and hang out for the ride. <laughs> if I can't do that on stage, I don't want to do anything. I don't, I'm not into scientific fucking or entertainment fucking or nothing like that. Fucking is fucking, and entertainment is entertainment. <laughs> if you can blend the two, that's pretty cool. And I did for a while, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that's... That's just how that goes. Did you find when when doing those, the shows, uh, the grumpy shows and whatnot, with the cow, the cows with the Z? Uh, I think we talked. We might have talked about this last time, so bear with me if we're. Repeating. We only did that once, yeah, it, yeah, and that took like negotiating peace in the Middle East to do that one. I really lucked out, and the dudes in uh, Paul Sanders and Paul Erickson from Hammerhead agreed to like just learn the parts, and uh, you know. Imagine trying to learn Thor's parts from right. listening to the record. I mean, pretty pretty unique player to begin with, but yeah, it's uh, as you mentioned, you're not exactly featuring parts; you're featuring songs, right? So it's sort of like, what is it? Is, what is it doing there? <laughs> right, it's impossible. I mean, Thor writes blues turned inside out, and he does it on yeah. purpose. And like, yeah, there's no way anybody can figure that shit out. So yeah, he was a brave guy to even try it. And, Paul Erickson was even braver because he learned all of Kevin's parts on the bass so we could rehearse and he didn't even get to play live and take the credit for it. So yeah, that was pretty awesome. I never thought they'd agree to it in a million years, but I had to pitch it and yeah, they were immediately eager to do it. So that's how that happened. I can't do that again. It's <laughs> no a lot way. of effort. Yeah. And unless, you know, I never thought we could pull it off without Thor, Kevin, and I together and that chemical reaction. And, uh, yeah, we, I, I think we got pretty close. Uh, Paul Sanders is a pretty wild guy and, and so is Paul Erickson. So yeah, I think it was, uh, I think we did a good job on that, but to do it again is pretty literally impossible. Yes. Did you find it? Was even, yeah, oh. Kevin lives in California. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. just re regionalism alone, uh, especially for somebody. And the cows despise nostalgia. And, and uh, yeah, so, the, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's emotionally kind of a tricky thing to pull off, too. Did you find that it was mostly, like, folks from back in the day, like like older folks on it, or was there kind of some of these? And the reason why I ask that is because there's kind of this new crop of kids, and I'm calling them kids. Right, but they're not actually yeah. kids that are they, they never got to see a lot of these bands the first time around and but they love the music, they love the records, they 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 find um they they found Well you know, that's interesting them. you bring that up because somebody else told me, a young person, that uh there's like a secret group of young people out there way in the ground that gets together at parties and plays just like noise, like feedback and and shit like that and it's a real small little scene but it's growing and and apparently in that scene the cows are like a big thing so so I'm oh yeah i remember who told me that now but he told me his daughter was in that oh, particular wow. subculture nice. and that it was actually pretty big and uh he he bawled me out because I haven't been very good at collecting royalties from the internet and all that stuff. And I said, yeah, you're right. I, I have no head for business. Another reason I quit music is because half of it is selling yourself on the internet now, which is the most boring fucking thing in the universe. I don't want to make music and then do fucking homework. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> the, it's it. the worst, man. Yeah, it's oh, <laughs> yeah, I have, to, uh, I have to put on my salesman cap now. And, yeah, yeah, gross. Nah, it's not for me. It's, it's like a... uh, if it's for other people, more power to them. It's not how my head works. Yeah, projectile vomiting from my perspective. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to do it. And that was the other thing, you know, when the heroin sheiks were starting up, is that all the new 
you know, all the new bands with young kids in them, they love that shit. And not only were they willing to work hard on the internet for free, they were willing to play for free. Like, how am I supposed to compete with that? And then then after a while, it got got to be, so if you weren't willing to go on the internet for three hours a day, you couldn't even be in a band or unless you hired someone else to do it and all that. Yeah, I hate showbiz. The passion, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, it's... You know, the cows came up in a subculture, and that was a subculture that wanted certain things, and, uh, you know, it was kind of, it was a loser. So it was a subculture for losers, basically. I mean, no offense, but yeah, it was a subculture that glorified losers. It's punk rock. Look at that sub pop More shirt. of a loser than a, than a, yeah, it was a bigger loser than a punk. As the movement started up, that was the whole point of it. And we became a part of that. That subculture is dead and gone. So, uh, yeah. But there is There's different, no point. so, so yeah. counterpoint, there is a yeah. subculture that is different than it was then, mm-hmm. right? That still celebrates the music and sees it, you know, with whatever the modern context is. I mean, the fact that, like, a song like Hitting the Wall uh-huh. can, can, like, strike a chord with, like, a 17-year-old now if they, you know, happen, manage to happen upon it, if, they, if the Spotify algorithm deems it so. Uh, well, you know, there's something to be said the for thing. that. That's the thing, though. Like, the cows and the heroin sheiks, I mean, we live in a time and a place. Now, we actually, the idea behind the music actually was is that you know we're in this subculture we're we're of it but we're actually trying to make music that is timeless that you know back then nobody is before nirvana hit nobody thought that they were going to get rich or be a rock star it never occurred to anyone so we tried to make music that that was timeless that like we may fail we may lose but maybe 30 or 40 years from now, some alienated kid will pick this up and they'll get it. If, if you know, the larger culture right now isn't getting it, maybe somebody in the future will get it. And uh, yeah, like that. So I was happy, you know, I was surprised when I heard about that subculture, but yeah, I kind of figured it would happen someday. I'm just surprised it's happening so soon. Yeah, it seems like all the cycles are happening sooner now, right? Like everything's <laughs> just cycling quicker than it ever used to. Like it took 10 years for, uh, hey, everybody, rock is back. And now it's like every three years, I feel like, maybe if that. Yeah, I don't think the nature of this particular subculture is nostalgic. But, you know, like the punks, we listened to the old blues guys who lived with their dukes and did whatever they wanted. And, and we liked that. and. Someday some kids will listen to it and it'll be brand new to them. They won't have any idea the actual stuff that inspired it, but and maybe they don't they, care. Wherever they are in life right now, they will get that part of it, and and, and nobody ever heard of us. So yeah, you, there's that cool thing where you're playing a band that nobody ever heard of, and they were ahead of their time, and and uh, yeah, that's all you can hope for, really. Well, there's something to be said for that, right? I mean, if you're if you're making music that's not meant to be purposefully ephemeral, then the idea is even if you're not finding your audience immediately, doesn't mean you can't find it later. Yeah, that's why, generally speaking, we didn't play political music because that dates something. Not yeah. that we weren't political at all; it's, it's it, it just dates you. Yeah, it's true. So uh, we played around with it metaphorically, but you know, and. But very few cow songs are about politics per se. For that reason, it would date it. Yeah, if you if you if you do rock against Reagan, you're you're like it's a punchline to a joke at this point. You're like that was a hundred thousand years ago, but like right, <laughs> it right. probably seems great it's, at the time. It's nostalgia, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> Reference in a comedic bit on Saturday Night Live or something, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, and it got to be cliche even back then. After a while, people stopped doing it, but uh, yeah. I, uh, we're just a little subculture, and uh, Ronald Reagan ain't anywhere in earshot. So, what I'm saying about. <laughs> <laughs> well, Shannon, uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you. It's it's. Oh, we're done already. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah. It's time, time to time to time to wrap it up. Um, again, for folks that maybe haven't heard it, there's a, another episode uh, 206, uh, I believe, where we go into even more in depth than the cows. But it's always a pleasure to to hear your thoughts. I think Heroin Cheeks is a band that. 
Like, like, okay, if you would, so let's 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 throw out this scenario. Say there's money. Suspend disbelief. Say there's money for a heroin chic's reunion. What lineup would you do? Uh, I couldn't say. I've never even thought about that for an instant. So that would be. That would be. Uh, uh, I guess it probably would end up being whoever agreed to it for some re- <laughs> for some reason. Do some mix and matching. <laughs> yeah, I mean everybody was top notch in their own way, and uh, yeah, if uh, if that ever happened. Technically speaking, I suppose it would be with the Minneapolis people, since that's where I am, if they would agree to such a thing. That, that was logistically easy for sure. But anyway, that was just a derivation. I was, I was, I was just thinking about that because it's, there's like almost um, – you you're, you're, you may not love this analogy, but it's almost like King Crimson or something where it's like, oh, what, what lineup of King Crimson? You know, like there's different eras that are oh so different from each other, so – Oh, okay. Yeah, I get that. I think uh, not I'm musically, not, but uh, just in- you got it all over me in rock history and uh, that way. But uh, yeah, there's some bands that have been through a lot of people. I mean, Black Flag just went through a big problem with that a few years ago, didn't they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was two of them. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say they they managed to do the thing that's the Spinal Tap s cliche and have two different versions of the band going at uh, different times. So that's a different podcast, and that's a uh... yeah, it sure is. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> this one's out of time. I'm I'm guessing. <laughs> Shannon, uh, thank you so much, man. This this is uh, it's been great, and I think everyone should uh, go to Reptilian, pick up uh, pick up the reissue, um, out of Afurica, Afurica, Afurica. Afirica Afirica. Or Afirica. It rhymes with America. Afir- yes. Out of Afirica. Okay, there you go. Now now I'm going to get it. Again, if I have to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> Not so great. It seemed like a good idea at the time because I've been in anthropology. But yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just uh, America and worldwide. Conan is the best. You should always listen to his show. To the extent I sounded like a halfway intelligent person, it's because of his insightful questions. So there um, you go. You you flatter me, sir, and I, I will I will certainly let you do that. But I, I appreciate. Yeah, it. I'm not <laughs> even getting Eddie Haskell about it or anything. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it's always a pleasure. I'm very glad to hear that uh, there's another reissue coming from that. I think those heroin cheeks records are, are great, and I think not enough people have listened yeah. to them. So I hope they it's an opportunity for people to check that out too. Matter of what, I'll, t- I- I'll tell you what, Conan, maybe I'll form another band and play out and make a couple albums just so we could do an interview about it. <laughs> that That is the longest game for the smallest reward I've ever heard of. That's amazing. <laughs> You're too modest, sir. <laughs> Shannon, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Talk to you later. Until next time. Bye-bye. Thanks. Oh, there we go, Shannon Selberg. What a great guy. What, 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 what an awesome dude that guy is. Uh, uh, a pleasure, an absolute pleasure. So, yeah, if you haven't already, check out episode, I believe, 206 uh, for, I guess, the bookend, part one of part two, part two of part one. Uh, make of that what you will. Uh, let's listen to, well, let's, just, let's just do Stab by an Angel here, and I'll, I'll play us out afterwards. Thanks so much for listening. Protonic Reversal, ProtonicReversal.com.
Abba and Angel, the heroin sheiks, out of the Furica. Hitting the wall, cows. Featuring Shannon Silberg. Amazing Shannon Silberg. For that heroin cheeks. Stab by an angel. Thanks so much for listening, folks. Uh, Shannon Silberg is awesome. Always appreciate having that guy on. He's a very intelligent dude. Heroin cheeks out of a Ferrica. Reptilian Records, reptilianrecords.com. Go check that out. First time ever on vinyl. Uh, like I said, underrated band. I actually felt really bad about kind of giving it short shrift when I had them on last time. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope everyone checks it out because uh, underrated band. It, yes, it's different than the cows, but underrated. Anyway, anyway. Thanks so much for listening. The name of the show is Conan Neutron's Protonic Reversal. The show airs live Thursdays, 8 Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific on Radio Nope. Say yes to no. Archives are available. ProtonicReversal.com. Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. ProtonicReversal.com. Uh, always free. No ads, no sponsors, no kidding. If you like the show and you want an episode sooner... And or want to support the show. One dollar a month. Patreon.com slash Protonic Reversal. We'll achieve that goal. 50,000 watts of power. Subscribe on YouTube, uh, Spotify, uh, your favorite podcasting app, whatever. Whatever it is people are listening to these days. Uh, that helps the show as well. And uh, it's always appreciated. Thanks, folks, for liking the episodes and the various things you like. Microphone turns sound Sharing it around. If you like it, tell a friend. Tell an enemy. Tell a friend of me. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Stay safe out there. Out on Route 
28th, the dark and lonely. And take it easy. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the, it's the end of radio. The last announcer plays the last record. The last what? Leaves the transmitter. Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now? broadcasting if there's no one there to receive it's the end of radio as we come to the close of our broadcast day
emergency. Uh.